everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman and my good friend David Zills, the apologist, is back. How you doing? I'm hanging in there. Huh? I'm, That's, uh, it's a Monday, isn't it? <laughs> it's, uh, I'm feeling the Mondays. That's okay. I, I um yeah every we, it's that we're recording this the the night after the Super Bowl and even if you're like not into football for some reason it's just hard to get restful when the whole of uh the country's up late and you, you, it's it, it's been a thing um let's 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 get going guys all right so um, <laughs> moving kind of right along uh I asked what you kind of wanted to tackle today and uh, you threw out a, a well it, it's it's sort of the thing we've been circling this whole time and. It? Yeah, uh, yeah, the resurrection of Jesus. So um, we talked uh, about uh, the deity of Jesus. Who is Jesus? And I think that's that's the the center point of the case for Christianity because you can give evidence that God exists, but then that doesn't establish Christianity over, say, Islam or Judaism or other things. Doesn't tell you what kind of God or how you can have a right relationship with God. Um, you can talk about a lot of things. Uh, why does God allow suffering? But at the end of the day, what sets Christianity apart is the person of Jesus. And so I think that is the key. But along the way, it's helpful to talk about the resurrection because a lot of people can claim to be anything they want. You know, I can claim to be, you know, the son of God. And we, we talked, you know, that you can't just claim these things. You have to have the character to back it up. But in addition to Jesus' character, which backs up his claims and the fact that he actually acts like someone who is incredibly sane and cares about people and not a liar or a lunatic, I think another thing that supports his deity is if he actually rose from the dead then uh that's that's kind of unparalleled you know people and and i think it's important to talk about what we mean by raised from the dead because lots of people have resuscitated you know they've been they've been passed out that you know maybe clinically dead so we've talked about near-death experiences and those kinds of things and they come back and then and then they live for a while and then they eventually die again and what sets the resurrection of Jesus apart is that he's actually victorious over death is the Christian claim. And that, that becomes important with something we'll talk about today, um, which is, did Jesus actually die on the cross? Um, but, but the idea is that Jesus' death was once and for all, and his resurrection is once and for all. And so he's not going to die again. He is actually his new life is an immortal life that's different from the life he had prior to his crucifixion and that somehow this is the start of the renewal of all things that God is going to do at the end of time. And so we're starting to talk like this and sounds very religious and like hokey. And, you know, are we talking about fairy tales here? So we want to say, is this something that we can actually have confidence in historically? Is this, is, are we in the realm of like Zeus and Aphrodite and, you know, the, the mythology, or is this something that's actually historical and we can ground ourselves in? And I think, you know, it's important to admit that this is a little bit of a crazy claim. I mean, when, when people think, well, you expect me to believe that? I mean, I think it's important to realize, yes, it's 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 definitely an extraordinary claim. And so we, we want to take seriously objections to it and say, you know, can we can we actually establish this with historical evidence? Are there other options for explaining the data? And so so we need to look at that. Yeah, and if we do actually believe this, and we do, even though it is crazy, then we can actually have it subjected to other theories, and we don't have to necessarily be worried about it either. Yeah, um, that, that's been a theme of our talks, is that this is not a faith that you kind of close your eyes and then leap into the dark and hope it's true. This is something you can look at eyes wide open, examine it, scrutinize it. It's okay to doubt it. Um, because if it's true, it'll stand up to scrutiny. And so we welcome those kinds of questions. It's it's important that as a church, that when people have these doubts or questions, or maybe they don't even believe this stuff and they want to talk about it, mm -hmm. we've got to be welcoming to that, not just kind of have this, well, you either believe or you don't kind of attitude, you know? Right. So with this in mind, then, uh, we made in a, a previous episode, a pretty compelling case that Jesus is God, um, not just sort of by uh, that he claimed to be, but but that he he holds together all of the attributes of God in, in his character and his behavior in, in everything that he does and, and is. Uh, so did God die? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's the the 
Sunday school thing, Jesus died for my sins. So we're not talking about the meaning of Jesus' death. We're just talking about the fact of Jesus' death. Mm -hmm. Did he die on the cross? Is that something that we can say? So this is, um, to take a step back, this is the, uh, there are a couple approaches that people have used to um, making a case for Jesus' resurrection. And we'll start with the one called the minimal facts argument. And this was really developed by Gary Habermas, he's a professor, philosophy professor at Liberty University, probably the world's leading Christian expert. Um, maybe people like, probably we put a, along with him people like uh, uh, William Lane Craig and N.T. Wright, but those are really the three who have really developed the most um, the most rigorous Christian defenses of the resurrection of Jesus, not assuming the Bible is necessarily even true, not even inspired, not even necessarily historically reliable in general, but just saying, how can we look at the facts and test the facts and then use the facts to make a case for the resurrection? And the minimal of facts approach is unique to Gary Habermas and his protege, Mike Lacona, they wrote a book together the case for the resurrection of Jesus, which uh, I think Mike wrote under with Gary while he was getting his master's at Liberty. Mm. Uh, Mike Lacona went on to get his PhD and wrote his dissertation on the topic and turned his dissertation into a thick book, um, The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach. That's and a big boy. Yeah, and I was nerdy enough that I read the whole thing. So good for you. Um, but it, it there's a lot there. I like it because it's very systematic. It would seem like it's dry, but he's very organized and very good communicator. Um, and so Mike Lacona and Gary Habermas have this minimal effects approach, and kind of the 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 intuition is what is rather than assuming that we're gonna believe what Christians believe and make a case based on that. That's not going to be compelling to people who aren't already Christian. They say, let's look at the facts that have two criteria that, that to be a minimal fact or what Mike calls historical bedrock. One is, is there a lot of really, really good evidence for it? That's the most important one. Second one is, is it widely accepted by scholars who study this material regardless of their worldview? So they could be agnostic, atheist, Jew, um, anything. As long as they're following the evidence and that they're they're versed in this topic, uh, you know, biblical studies, New Testament studies, history, um, is there is there something that the majority of scholars have accepted? And the reason he, Mike Lacona takes this approach is because it gives us some reassurance that it's not just Christian bias that leads us to believe these things. If if everyone's believing this, even a lot of non Christians from a variety of perspectives. That, perspectives, then it gives us confidence that the evidence actually really is good enough that it's not bias that's leading people to accept these things. And um, there are additional facts that maybe aren't as, um, there's not as much consensus about, but they're still strongly evidenced. And we'll we'll talk about those later, but I want to talk about the three minimal facts. And the list of minimal facts has been shrinking at um, the, there are various numbers, but Mike Lacona in this book gives three. The first is Jesus died by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. Second is that shortly after his death, Jesus' followers had experiences that caused them to believe and proclaim that Jesus had risen from the dead and personally appeared to them as risen from the dead. And the third is that Paul, um, who was initially a persecutor of Christians, had an experience that caused him to convert that he interpreted as a resurrection appearance of the of Jesus. So it's actually interesting that those appearances are something that people think, yeah, those those experiences really happened. Um, the debate is how to interpret them. Are they subjective, things that happened just in the minds of these people that they thought were real but weren't? Or were they objective things that were actually real that would seem to indicate Jesus for us from the dead? So that's where the debate is, but there's not really a lot of debate that these experiences were real, that they actually thought that they had seen Jesus and interacted with Jesus alive. So that's kind of interesting. And so we'll talk about you know what's the evidence for those those appearances and how do we interpret them is it subjective objective maybe we're not sure it could be either and we'll have to look at the data and see what again you know using kind of the hypothesis testing approach which theories fit the data 
But the first of those we have to establish is that Jesus died by crucifixion. And the reason for this, uh, um, well, there, there's this story I, I like to tell, which um, is a little bit morbid, but um, there were two hunting brothers uh, who, they, they, they loved to hunt. They went on this annual hunting trip every year. And so one year they're out in the deer stand and all of a sudden one of them just, just goes unconscious, falls out of the deer stand. Um, his brother goes down, looks for a pulse. There is none. He's non-responsive and he thinks, uh-oh. So he gets his cell phone out and he happens to have enough coverage to make an emergency call. So he calls 911 and the person, you know, says, you know, what's, what's going on? And he says, well, I think my brother's dead and I don't know what to do. And the, the emergency responder said, um, okay, I think I can help. We have to make sure that he's dead. And so there's a silence and then a shot is heard. And then the brother's <laughs> voice came back on saying, okay, what next? <laughs> so it's really morbid. I was not expecting that from you today. All right. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, what do we, we have do to make story? sure we okay. have to make sure Jesus is dead because if he's not dead, he can't rise. And so this is kind of the alternative theory to the resurrection, which is, well, Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. So when he appeared, he was alive, but he wasn't alive after dead because he never died in the first place. So if Jesus is going to rise, he has to first be dead. And so we have to make sure Jesus is dead. I don't advocate for for going back in time and shooting Jesus. To make sure it with a spear. I mean, we're okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So we'll, yeah, we'll get into that. Um, so, so what's the evidence that Jesus died by crucifixion? Um, and it turns out that this is like really solid. Like this is, there's yeah. not really any debate here. Um, not, not a lot, not a credible debate. That's serious debate, yeah. Not serious debate. And so, I mean, Jesus' crucifixion is mentioned by non-Christian authors. Tacitus talks about how Jesus suffered. He calls it the most extreme penalty under Pontius Pilate. And then a mischievous superstition broke out in Judea and then in Rome, which kind of hints at this belief in the resurrection. Why are people following a dead man? That seems a little weird. Um, Lucian, the Greco-Roman satirist, he has this really, it's honestly kind of funny if you don't take yourself too seriously, his his critique of Christians. He's like, so uh, yeah, these creatures, they worship a crucified man. Mm -hmm. You can see him kind of like a, a, on SNL or something. And he's like, and they start with the general belief that they're immortal for all time. And all this, they take quite on, quite on faith and, and, and they're worshiping a crucified guy. So um if you it's say interesting. a like that, yeah, I mean, you're, I get it's, it. It sounds pretty weird, dude. <laughs> yeah, so so he's he's making fun, and and we'll we'll circle back to that at the end. But he's he's lending corroboration that Jesus was crucified, and that people were worshiping him. We talked about the worshiping part when when we talked about Jesus was God, and that belief in Jesus' deity is not a legend. It goes back early, and it's attested from lots and lots of sources going back to the beginning. Um, but he's also lending credence here that Jesus was crucified. Like this was just known. This was like one of the things that was most obvious about Jesus was that he was crucified. Um, it's just, um, so the question is, can you survive crucifixion? And it turns out we have record of somebody who did. Um, so Josephus, um, I think it was Josephus talks about how, um, in the, in the, siege of Jerusalem when when the Rome came in 70 AD and wiped out Jerusalem and kind of destroyed the Israel nation until you know the 20th century Josephus had three friends that were crucified and he begged Titus the the commander please take them down give them medical treatment and they did and still two of them died but one of them didn't so I, th I think uh this is like the only record we have of someone surviving crucifixion but it's theoretically possible okay. um if you come down early enough and you're given medical treatment but it's highly unlikely especially when you look at the details of jesus crucifixion which there are extra details about jesus crucifixion that kind of uh, put the nail in the coffin so to speak so yeah. um so so first is that jesus the beating so we have right. records um early records of crucifixion that do talk about beatings prior to crucifixion and among other tortures and we have records of veins and arteries being exposed bones being exposed intestines being 
being exposed. So the, these were not like light beatings. This was enough to kill someone in and of itself. Um, there, there's an author who talks about the condition of people on the cross as being pretty much unrecognizable, which is interesting when you think about Isaiah 53, yeah. when the prophet hundreds of years before Jesus talks about this, this, uh, the servant of God, who's unnamed being unrecognizable and, and kind of scoffed at. And if you, if you want to read something interesting from a non-Christian perspective, look at Isaiah 53 and think if you think and ask the question, is this a Jewish writing or a Christian writing? It sounds Christian, but it's Jewish. And it was before Jesus crucifixion, but it sounds like it's talking about Jesus. Right. Um, but the condition on the cross after these beatings, like it's not good. Um, then you look at details of Jesus light of Jesus crucifixion, um, the fact that his legs were broken, which is also something that we um, that is attested that was known to happen to crucified victims. And the idea was you, if you can't push yourself up with your legs to breathe, you die of asphyxiation. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to do some, if you want to accelerate death, you break their legs. And if you want to prolong the torture, you don't break their legs. And so in the case of Jesus, they broke the legs. It No, they broke the legs of the people on either side. But when yeah. they looked at Jesus, they he's said, oh, he's dead. already dead, which wouldn't have been hard to tell because if he's not pushing up to breathe, um, you know, Roman soldiers were experts at death. That was their, that was their job. And, and they, they said he was dead, but just to be sure, like you said, they pierced him in the side and blood and water came out and different, um, medical professionals have looked at what does this blood and water mean? And how could that be signs that maybe he was already dead, you know, as those Roman soldiers said, but let's just say for the sake of argument, Jesus did survived the crucifixion and I, this is my favorite place to go because it shows how absurd this theory is and the rebuttal to this i think the ultimate rebuttal to this theory which is sometimes called the swoon theory that jesus swooned on the cross he passed out but mm -hmm. didn't die and so there was no resurrection it was just him reviving in the tomb the the critique of this is 150 years old that that's how long people have not been taking this seriously and it's by a someone named D.F. Strauss, and he said, okay, let's let's just play this out, okay? So Jesus is really, really in bad shape. He's in the tomb. Somehow he comes back. They thought he was dead, but he wasn't. Somehow he comes back. Maybe there's this stone in front of the tomb that he takes his, you know, his hands that have, you know, had nails through them, and he pushes away this huge stone. Are there guards? Maybe there are guards. If there are guards, somehow he gets away. Um, and then he goes to his disciples and says, hey, guess what, guys? I've defeated death. And his disciples are like, whoa, you really have. Like, this is not someone who's crucified and comes back, uh, comes to in the tomb is not going to give the impression that they've conquered death. Are they alive? Barely. Are they the conquerors of death? Not at all. And so there's no way that Jesus would have inspired his disciples to be bold in the face of death, thinking that he had somehow defeated death when he's like barely alive and needs medical treatment. And so fact of the matter is, this is not a theory that's taken seriously today. The fact that Jesus died on the cross is extremely credible historically. Even people who love to poke holes at the resurrection don't poke holes at the death of Jesus. It's, it's very well established. Fair enough. All right. So if this is the case, and, and it's it's pretty hard to like, you have to really sort of come up with some stuff. Uh, I, I heard one where aliens were somehow involved. Like it, it's 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 great to me actually how absurd some of these these uh, these excuses to sort of keep Jesus alive uh, actually are because it it shows just the scandal of the resurrection. If you have to go sort of this far into into highly improbable things just to avoid something that is is also really absurd it's because well it it, it has weight um what you're you're clinging to is just as unlikely to happen if not more so yeah i've heard it said that you know it's hard to believe in the miracle of the resurrection but when you look at the data you're eventually going to have to pick a miracle maybe the disciples had a mass hallucination we'll talk about the odds of that um statistically 
maybe aliens were involved, but what, however it works, you know, I've heard it said, pick your miracle. Yeah. And I think the miracle that makes the most sense in the context of what we've talked about, about the person of who Jesus is, um, how he fits the profile of God, not just with his claims, but his character and how he doesn't really leave alternative theories about who he is open to us. I think the, the resurrection makes the most sense, but you talked about the scandal of the resurrection. And I think first we have to talk about the scandal of the cross because yeah. we've presented evidence that Jesus is God. We've presented evidence that Jesus died on a cross. And so now you've got this idea yeah. that God died on a cross, which it's hard for modern people to understand how crazy that idea is to people at the time. And this is why Lucian could make fun of it. They worship a crucified man. Like, you know, you can That's hear the opposite of what are supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we have to talk about, you know, Paul says in first Corinthians one and two, he talks about how the gospel is foolishness to, to Greco Romans. Cause they, this doesn't make sense that God would die on a cross and then come back to life in a bodily form where the body is supposed to be evil. So I think it might be worth, and this probably is a topic for its own conversation, but what does Paul mean when he says the gospel is foolishness? And it kind of gets at this issue of what's the relationship between faith and reason. Um, you know, Luther in the third the explanation of the third article of the creed says, I cannot by my own reason or strength. Mm -hmm. So is reason opposed to faith? And then why are we doing apologetics? And so I think untangling that we could take an aside and talk about yeah, that. Let's do that next time. Sounds good. Awesome. All right. So we, we've tackled one of these and we've already kind of been at time two. Maybe we should take a little break here and we'll come back and hit the second and the third. What do you think? Sounds good. All right. Have a good one. All right. You too.